Well, at first I'd like to thank God for this opportunity. <laughs> just joking. Well, uh, let me say just a moment. I, I too have a sense of humor. <laughs> In the spirit of that, could somebody take that awful picture? <laughs> Can I tell you a story about that? May I? Oh, of course, please. A few years ago, the Guardian newspaper asked to have a joint interview with me and David Attenborough, one of our great heroes. And we met, and we had a nice conversation, and we talked and talked, and we were laughing and laughing and laughing for the entire conversation and the photographer was taking photographs all the time, and we were laughing. I, I would think that he must have taken 200 photographs, and 99% of them must have had us laughing, and the one they printed <laughs> showed us looking belligerent, sticking our chins out at each other as though we were about to come to blows. What is it about you journalists? <laughs> What's the second most beautiful discovery in biology? Assuming that evolution is the first, of course. I think that's got to be DNA, hasn't it, really? Mm -hmm. um, that's got to be the moment when it was realized that life is fundamentally digital. And Darwin himself would have been utterly thrilled. Some scientists say uh, the idea of God is not a problem at all. They say, if there's a God, well, I'm happy here trying to discover his laws. But you disagree with this point of view, right? Uh, why do you disagree? I think it's a form of intellectual cowardice. Um, because the whole enterprise of science, and I think in particular evolutionary science, which is my science, is directed towards, with remarkable success, directed towards explaining how you can get complex things if you start with simplicity. Our explanation today of the existence of life, which is fiendishly complicated, our explanation of, of life starts with ultimate simplicity. The origin of life was relatively simple, the origin of the universe even more simple. Modern science, starting with ultimate simplicity, has worked out how you can gradually climb by slow degrees to complexity of the order of the human brain. People interpret uh, all the phallic stuff of Freud and concepts of, uh, of Jung uh, as science, as science just like heliocentrism. Uh, I'm asking, this is a modern, my, my, maybe this is a modern uh, mythology. Mythology masquerading as, as, as science. Yes. And um, I think a, a case can be made that Freudianism is a kind of mythology masquerading as science. Um, a lovely story told by Peter Medawa, Sir Peter Medawa, great British biologist, who was actually born in Brazil. Um, he uh, was satirizing um, a theory of what Darwin's illness was, was. You know, Darwin was an invalid for most of his life. He was a very fit, healthy young man when he traveled in South America. But then, for, well, once he got back to England, he became an invalid. He was sick most days. And one theory of how he got sick was that he was bitten. We know he was bitten, actually, while in South America by the, uh, the great black bug of the pampas, which gives you Chagas disease. I'm sure you get yeah. Chagas disease here. Um, and some of his symptoms um, fit Chagas disease. Meadow was considering this theory. Before considering it, he considered a Freudian theory of what was wrong with, with Darwin. And the Freudian theory said that Darwin so hated his father, <laughs> Darwin, so hated his earthly father that he wished to slay his heavenly father. This theory was advanced by a Freudian psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, um, who, and then Medawa satirically said, 
Darwin's hatred of his father, Dr. Robert Darwin, is evidenced by the fact that he called his father the kindest and wisest man I ever knew. <laughs> evidence, if evidence were needed, of how deeply his hatred had been repressed. <laughs> well, that's a satirical summary of the Freudian worldview, where everything is explained. And if it's apparently not explained, if the opposite appears to be the case, then you just explain it away by saying it was repressed. So there is a danger that something that looks like science actually isn't science. It's a closed system which doesn't admit of any kind of um, refutation. A little bit about your personal point of view. Um, I've read sometimes that you do not agree with affirmative actions like positive discrimination, as you say in UK, uh, to fight racism. Uh, so what should be a better way to fight racism? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because um, affirmative action appeals to our sense of justice, in a way. Um, you, you could say, I mean, some people will say something like, um, uh, people of disadvantaged groups, whether it's a disadvantaged race or a disadvantaged sex, have been paying for centuries for being disadvantaged. So it's time to redress the balance. It's time to make things fair again. But of course, it isn't really fair to, uh, in, in, in a sense, to avenge the wrongs that were done to people in past centuries by taking it out on people of this century. If it's true, and it surely is true, that say uh, black people were in, well, black people were enslaved in the West Indies, in South America, in North America, and therefore somehow they, modern black people should be paid back by affirmative action uh, at the expense of modern white people. Is that a bit unfair? Because modern white people were not responsible for the enslavement. We're not responsible for what our ancestors of our own color or sex, or whatever it was, did. So I think there is an injustice in affirmative action which uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be noticed. Um, and when, I mean, I, I, my, my view is that we should stop discriminating altogether. I like the story of the great conductor, George Schulte, who, when um, auditioning for his orchestra, I think it was the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, he would have the instrumentalists come and play their instrument behind a screen so he couldn't tell what sex they were. He didn't want to discriminate in either direction, either in favor of females or in favor of males. And they even had to remove their shoes so that he couldn't tell by listening to uh, the footsteps whether they were wearing high heels or not. Well, I admire that. I, I admire the total abolition of discrimination of all kinds. Let's be completely sex blind and race blind when we uh, choose for employment or, or anything else. The, uh, as the creator of the concept of the memes, you might get defensive sometimes about the overuse of the term <coughs> internet meme, but you don't. You, um, do you think that the, the, the internet memes and stuff are are a good way to research the to research the concept. It, the, the internet is a first class uh, ecosystem for memes. Memes uh, are just units of cultural inheritance, uh, analogous to genes in in, in Darwinian evolution. Uh, Darwinian evolution is all about the differential survival of genes in gene pools. Some genes survive, other genes don't. The ways in which genes survive are by programming bodies to be good at surviving and good at passing on those genes. Mostly that means good at reproducing. Having written the Sunset <coughs> Gene, which was all about that, I wanted to end in the last chapter by dispelling the view that only genes, only DNA, can serve as a unit of natural selection. I could have used computer viruses an exam as an example, but they'd have been a very good example, but in those days, computer viruses either hadn't been invented 
or I didn't know about them. <laughs> so instead, I used cultural inheritance, things like tunes that somebody whistles in the street. You whistle a tune in the street, and before you know it, somebody else has heard that tune, and they whistled it. And so it can spread like a, an epidemic around the city. Um, it happens in non-human animals too. In Britain, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, when milk bottles were placed on doorsteps every morning, birds, mostly tits, great tits and blue tits, learned, or one or two clever individual tits, learned how to open the milk bottles and drink the cream. And it was well documented that this habit spread as an epidemic, just like a measles epidemic, just like a flu epidemic. So memes then are units of cultural inheritance which spread just like genes do. At least that is what I wanted to propose. Now, whether they also serve as the basis for a kind of Darwinian selection is another matter. And it, that's an interesting question. And it's a question which you can't really th attempt to answer until you've recognized that memes do actually exist, which they surely do. Uh, accents, clothes, fashions, tunes, um, uh, verbal habits, all sorts of things spread through the human meme pool uh, as, people, as people imitate. In my lifetime, I've seen a worldwide wide epidemic of the baseball cap. Uh, and then another another epidemic of the baseball hat worn backwards. <laughs> um, these are mimetic epidemics. Um, now, the, the internet is a new phenomenon which didn't exist when I first proposed the meme. And of course, the internet is a beautiful place for memes to spread. Uh, it's a wonderful vehicle for memes to spread, and they are indeed spreading. Um, so yes, they, I, I like the phrase internet meme because um, it, it is a, because the internet as I say, is a, a terrific place for memes to spread. I don't so much like the more restrictive use of internet meme to mean something like a picture with a bit of writing on it. Um, <laughs> which I think a lot of young people think that, that's what a meme is. Well, it damn well isn't. Um, uh, it, it would be unfortunate if the phrase internet meme were adopted for that because that would remove the possibility of using the phrase for the much more general phenomenon of the spread of units of cultural inheritance uh, using the internet as an ecosystem. I'd just like to say thank you very much. For the